Okay, so it's time to get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this lecture series event. Uh, my name is Terry Peters. I'm an assistant professor at Ryerson University in the Department of Architectural Science. I'm also co-chair of this season's uh, lecture series committee uh, along with Professor Will Galloway. Um, welcome to everyone tuning in from Toronto and elsewhere uh, to this department and to the lecture series. So the theme of our series is disruptions. So we're interested in new ways of thinking about uh, learning and practicing architecture, new ways of teaching, new ways of thinking about some of the big ideas um, in practice. So this lecture series is designed to be a real learning opportunity for our students and to have students engage with issues facing our profession and the building industry. All of our lectures um, in the fall term are online due to COVID-19 restrictions, and we're hoping to have some in-person lectures in the January term. I'd also like to thank our sponsors of the lecture series, the Ontario Association of Architects and the uh, Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Thank you for supporting our lecture series. It's our tradition to begin meetings with a land acknowledgement, which not only recognizes the enduring presence and resilience of Indigenous peoples in our area, but it's also a reminder that we are all accountable to these relationships. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share this territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. It is in this spirit and on behalf of our university that I welcome you to Ryerson and to our department. And on the behalf of our faculty, I welcome you. Now I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Will Galloway. Will, you muted. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll repeat myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm Will Galloway. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Architectural Science. And uh, as Terry said, I'm co-chair along with her uh, in the lecture committee this year. Uh, tonight's lecture is by uh, Magdalena Milos, uh, who is an, an esteemed architect and researcher. And the title of her talk is Residential Schools and Settler Architects. Um, so I'm not going to do the introduction. We have a, a student who will be doing that. But I, I wanted to just uh, do a little bit of housekeeping things. So I, I wanted to um, point out that, uh, or sorry, to tell you what the um, what the order of events will be, I suppose. So we're, we're going to have a 45 to 50 minute lecture. And then all of the questions will be um, uh, taken after that. So if you have questions, uh, you can put them into the Q&A function of Zoom, not in chat. And then uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, one of our other students will take the, the lead in going through them and we'll have, I hope, a very robust discussion. Uh, and then um, after Magdalena's lecture, um, uh, sorry, excuse me, I'm repeating myself. Uh, so I'll actually just hand uh, over the introduction to Marwa al Sakar, who will introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Thanks, Will. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff at the Department of Architectural Science, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, trained as an architect, Magdalena Milos is a Polish-Canadian settler immigrant, writer, and scholar who is currently completing a PhD in the Peter Gohofu School of Architecture, McGill University. Her dissertation examines uh, architecture as a site of encounter between Indigenous people in the settler colonial state. Uh, and is supported by SSHRC, McGill University, the Canadian Centre for Architecture, and the Grant Foundation. Magdalena's writing, Architecture, Design, and Art, are based on examining the social and political forces that shape our environments. Magdalena has completed an honours Bachelor of Architectural Studies, a graduate diploma in Cognitive Science, and a Master of Architecture at the University of Waterloo, where her thesis, uh, Don't Let Fear Take Over, looked at the space and memory of residential schools, specifically on Ontario and Manitoba. Magdalena is also the current communication officer for the Society for the Study of Architecture in Canada. Uh, Magda's research and writing have appeared in RACAR, Journal of Society for the Study of Architecture in Canada, Cape Code, The Site Magazine, Canadian Architecture and elsewhere. Uh, a settler scholar, she lives and works at 
Haldimand Tract, uh, which is also known as Kitchener, Ontario, land promised to the Six Nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. It is an honor to welcome you, Magda, to our DAS community. Take it away. Thanks so much, Marwa, for that lovely introduction. And um, good evening. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here today. Um, uh, thank you to professors Terry Peters and Will Galloway and the rest of the lecture committee of the Department of Architectural Science uh, for the in invitation to speak with you. Um, so the title of my talk is Residential Schools and Settler Architects, and this evening I'll be talking about the role of architecture and architects in the residential school system. Um, so to begin, I would again like to acknowledge um, that uh, I am a settler immigrant scholar living and working in the Haldeman Tract, which is land promised to Six Nations, as well as part of the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. So if any of you are familiar at all with the history of residential schools, and if you're not, I will um, try to kind of uh, fill you in a little bit as I, as I go on. Um, but if you're familiar with this history or uh, the present day media depictions, you may have seen or heard uh, the phrase architect or architects of the residential school system. Um, so the image here is of a CBC News article with the headline, Memo Raises Doubts About Who Was Architect of Residential Schools. And this of course denotes not the kind of architect with whom we're familiar in an architecture school or an architecture firm, but a kind of mastermind figure, the ultimate culprit behind these institutions. Um, so the architect of residential schools is not the designer of their buildings, but the originator of the very concept, um, ultimately responsible for instigating over a century and a half of state removal of indigenous children from their families, causing harm that continues to echo as intergenerational trauma today. Um, but even though these public discourses use the terminology of architecture to point to something beyond the design of a building, they invariably have to do with buildings um, in two key ways. Um, and more broadly speaking, the built environment and public, public space. I apologize for that noise. Um, so as I was saying, they, the, the terminology of architecture um, uh, has to do with, with buildings uh, or more broadly the built environment and public space. So here is an image from the CBC article I had shown on my last slide. Um, and it shows the empty wall of a government building across from Parliament Hill in Ottawa. So a plaque bearing the name of Hector Louis Langevin had recently been removed from the wall and the building renamed from the Langevin block to the office of the prime minister and Privy Council. So Langevin was a minister of public works whose department was responsi responsible for building several early government sponsored industrial schools for indigenous children in the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta. Uh, he is quoted in an 1883 House of Commons debate justifying the expenditure on these institutions in quite racist terms, and as such has been called, quote, one of the original architects of the residential school system by the Canadian Encyclopedia. And almost ironically, um, the building that uh, you just saw in the previous uh, few slides, the uh, formerly Langevin block, um, uh, did once actually house the Department of Indian Affairs including, as you can see on this plan, the technical branch that housed architects. So, and judging from its placement uh, directly across from the office of the minister, this branch played an important role in the government's policies towards indigenous peoples. And um, as we will see in the creation of residential schools. So that minister, the, 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 whose office you saw in the previous plan um, until 1888 happened to be John A. Macdonald. Uh, Macdonald, of course, was prime minister when Canada adopted residential schools as a federal policy and was a significant supporter of the policy as well as uh, other ruthless treatment of Indigenous peoples, particularly in the prairies. 
And of course, there is also Egerton Ryerson, with, I'm, with whom I'm sure you're all familiar. Uh, Ryerson was a proponent of agricultural education for Indigenous peoples, and some of his writings, um, particularly his 1847 report of Dr. Ryerson on industrial schools, had an influence on the creation of the residential school system, which was set up two years after his death in 1883. So I think the larger issue here and why discussions of these so-called architects of the residential schools have become a matter of public discourse stems from the fact that these historical figures appear prominently in the built environment. Um, as we saw as statues and public squares or parks, names on schools, bridges, and other buildings. And as in the case of X university soon to be renamed, the identity of a large urban post-secondary institution. So various debates have sprung up about the merits of changing names and removing statues. Often indigenous actors and allies call for change while others debate, for instance, whether a historical figure deserves to be quote unquote vilified by removing their name or likeness from the public sphere or whether such removals constitute an erasure or whitewashing of history. But as architectural historian Del Upton has discussed, um, with regards to the removal of Confederate statues in the United States, the concern that such changes constitute an erasure of history comes from a conflation of history and heritage. So history on the one side is a scholarly endeavor that strives towards a more or less cohesive rendering of the past supported by evidence and heritage on the other often highlights elements of the past that have a special meaning uh, in a culture's collective memory. So things like monuments, plaques, statues, and historic sites serve to tell particular stories that unite certain groups in their understanding of the past. So this is not to say that history has ever been or is objective, but one can avoid reading a history journal um, and historians sort of try to prove the merit of their arguments um, while one cannot avoid names and images prominently displayed in public places. Um, or in fact spoken on a daily basis. So while there are historical discussions sort of happening to one side, there are these kind of much more charged visible debates and calls for action with regards to what types of heritage elements should form part of the public sphere. So the interpretation and public display of the past is I think not a straightforward issue anywhere but particularly in a now multicultural settler society adjacent to diverse indigenous societies and urban communities that are increasingly calling for equity, sovereignty, and redress. I wanted to talk about this sort of metaphorical um, notion of architects of the residential schools before I talked about um, the, the role of architects as we know them as the designers of buildings and other parts of the built environment um, because of the wider implications for the contemporary built environment but also because these latter architects are rather obscure. They have no monuments um, and worked more or less anonymously within a large bureaucracy, the so-called Department of Indian Affairs and its successors, as well as other government departments to sort of maintain and sustain the system throughout its roughly 100 years of existence. And I'm talking about 100 years as a federally supported policy. So they, they the, the, these architects weren't remarkable in any way and neither were their buildings, aside from the fact that they were part of this significant long-term event that has devastated indigenous communities across the country. So part of my current work is thinking about what it means to practice architecture for architecture to exist in a settler colonial state. And for those who might be unfamiliar with the term settler colonialism, is a particular kind of colonialism where a society of settlers, people who come from another place or places, attempts to replace existing indigenous societies on an expropriated land base. So Patrick Wolf has famous, famously characterized settler colonialism as defining a society where settler colonizers come to stay and invasion is a structure, not an event. So in other words, settler colonialism is not just something that happened in the 17th or 19th centuries but is an ongoing process that structures society in places like North America and Australia, among others. The logic of settler colonialism tends towards indigenous elimination, which is why the project of residential schooling was integral to settler colonialism. 
I think it's important to consider these types of spaces as students, practitioners, and historians of architecture to consider the importance of architecture and the role of the architectural profession in this history, not to celebrate them as worthy historical figures, but to acknowledge this aspect of the history of the profession and its impact on Indigenous communities to gain a fuller historical picture that can hopefully inform a more reflective and just present and future. So, oh, sorry. So, um, Early residential schools uh, for Indigenous children in Canada were founded by missionary organizations and were often referred to as homes. Principles stressed a home-like environment and indeed their architectural form frequently resembled uh, that of a large house uh, with features such as stairs ascending to a piano nobile, verandas and gables. Here you can see two early residential schools in Ontario and Manitoba, the Mohawk Institute, uh, in Brantford, Ontario, and the Bertle Residential School, which would continue, uh, both of which would continue to operate into the second half of the 20th century. So the continuation of these institutions for such a long time was because the Canadian government began to subsidize these existing religious schools as part of its policies of assimilation. Um, in doing so, it drew in part on a report submitted um, in 1879 by politician Nicholas Flood Davin, uh, which you can see here, who had been commissioned by John A. Macdonald to investigate residential institutions for Indigenous children in the United States as a possible model for Canada. And Davin recommended the government adopt a similar policy, but to begin by funding existent, existing missionary institutions rather than building its own. Um, however, he included uh, an architectural plan for a school along with uh, proximate costs, um, which unfortunately I have not been able to locate. However, this, uh, this addition of, a, of an architectural plan suggests that architectural questions were important for the residential schools from the very beginning of their conception as a kind of national system. So in addition to subsidizing existing mission boarding schools, the federal government opened a series of industrial schools in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, and the explicit purpose of these was to transform indigenous children into a laboring class of farmers and tradesmen with girls trained to be homemakers in their own homes or domestic servants in settler households. The industrial schools were usually designed by architects in the Department of Public Works, architectural historian, Janet Wright has this to say about them. Industrial schools were not outstanding works of architecture, but neither were they temporary makeshift buildings. In their scale and quality of construction, they formed permanent and imposing symbols of the dominance and supremacy of white society. The buildings demonstrated the government's commitment to and confidence in the industrial school system for absorbing and eradicating a distinct Aboriginal society on the prairies. In many respects, industrial schools reflected the same social and moral purposes as 19th century penitentiaries. The architecture of the building was seen to play an active part in the reform of what was regarded as deviant behavior. The design of these schools, which was firmly rooted in white society, was clearly intended to support and reinforce the values, skills, and codes of behavior in which the students were so rigorously indoctrinated. And that's from her book, Crown Assets, The Architecture of the Department of Public Works. So although uh, it presented a more institutional appearance than the earlier, some of the earlier mission schools, industrial schools like the one at Regina were thoroughly invested in domesticity as a tactic of assimilation. Uh, this particular building was completed in 1890 um, and it was a, a two-story uh, building built of white brick and topped by a pitched attic story and central cupola. The building was segregated by sex with separate entrances for boys and girls on the left and right, as you can see, um, uh, and a hall running between the two sides. On the ground floor, the boys side contained a large schoolroom, while the girls side has, had a similarly sized space subdivided into a schoolroom and a sewing room. Uh, administration spaces were aggregated in the center of the building, further isolating boys and girls 
and the building had a rear extension that had dining, kitchen, and laundry spaces. The second floor had 10 private staff rooms and sex segregated dormitories for 150 children. And like the physical organization of the school building, the institution's industrial training program was highly gendered. However, the spaces of labor were spatially inscribed in a different way than the symmetrical division of the main building might suggest. Um, and points to the importance of the wider residential school landscape. So the boys training spaces were distributed throughout the grounds and consisted of the farm and its outbuildings, a two story trades building, bake shop and blacksmith shop. So kind of not limited to this one main building. Um, for the girls vocational training extended throughout the interior of the, the main building itself. Um, and presumably also including the boys side where they were quote, taught housekeeping in doing the school housework under efficient instruction, as well as being given instruction in laundry work, dressmaking, dairying, and house painting. So the spaces of the school itself thus gained a double meaning, functioning as both an institution and a simulation of settler home life, its attendant tasks and chores serving as training in the eyes of staff. So these two types of institutions that I've just mentioned, um, the missionary boarding schools, which were the smaller um, uh, religious run uh, institutions, as well as the government industrial schools of which the Regina Industrial School in, is an example. Um, these form part of what art historian Jeffrey Carr has termed the first generation of residential schools. And Carr, by the way, has made the major contribution on the architectural history of residential schools so far. Um, focusing on institutions in British Columbia. So if you're interested um, in, uh, in more, uh, check out his work. So my own study of residential schools began during my master's degree, um, as, uh, as Marwa mentioned in, in her introduction. Um, and this was when my studio professor suggested that I consider residential schools as a thesis topic. And I had had no prior uh, learning about residential schools before. Um, so I was really, uh, like really, really interested in, in, in this history once I kind of fi found out uh, what, what it was about, about the fact that there's this, um, uh, I, I think it's a lot, it's a lot, better now in terms of, um, you know, teaching children and uh, university students about Canada's colonial past and present. Um, but uh, it was not something that I was familiar with at all. So I started by visiting um, the former Mohawk Institute, now the Six Nations owned Woodland Cultural Center, which is located in Brantford. And that was just half an, an hour and a half by bike from the Waterloo School of Architecture. So that's how I got there the several times I visited. Um, and incidentally, it's just an hour and a half by car from Toronto. And I encourage uh, everyone who's able to, to visit once it's uh, open for visitors again. Um, so this was back in 2013. And that year, uh, Six Nations decided to keep the building and restore it with the aid, aid of a campaign that they called Save the Evidence, um, which is still ongoing. Um, and this campaign had the ultimate goal of turning it into a historic site and a site of conscience, one of the first of its kind in Canada. So this particular building was built in 1904, so a little bit later than uh, the missionary and industrial schools that I showed you, um, but it was a replacement for a smaller structure with a domest uh, more domestic appearance um, uh, that I actually showed uh, in, in uh, one of the earlier slides. Um, and the reason they rebuilt it was because it had been burnt down by students protesting harsh institutional conditions. So this new building was designed by the Mohawk Institute's principal, Anglican minister Robert Ashton, and his son, uh, I suspect because uh, Ashton had already been the, pr the principal for about three decades and probably had strong opinions about how the new building should be arranged. So it's, it's neoclassical dressing. Um, this new building seemed to convey a more imposing institutional appearance than um, that kind of seemed to defy its precursor's destruction. Um, and tried to lend legitimacy to the institution. So for example, you can see this in the rusticated foundation um, 
the red brick walls with the coins um, and what used to be uh, prior to this photograph and now has been restored as a two-story portico with uh, four colossal Roman Doric columns. Um, so if you check out a, a Google image of the building today, you'll see how imposing um, that, uh, that looked. Um, and so again, while its uh, exterior was certainly imposing, um, and the sheer size of residential school buildings is actually something that many survivors say impacted them as children um, while attending. Um, it was the plan that really uh, defined their experience within, within the building. So the Mohawk Institute's H-shaped plan um, uh, is uh, you know, a little bit similar to the, the, what I described for the, um, the Regina Industrial School in that it's highly symmetrical, uh, to, in order to segre segregate uh, children by sex. Um, but it's this uh, very characteristic H-shaped plan. Um, and while it has maintained that, that shape more or less, um, it's been sort of uh, continuously reshaped throughout its 117 year existence. So this particular plan is from a 1950 renovation, um, which still approximately resembles what's there today. Uh, the building was uh, rigidly segregated by sex, as I, as I mentioned, um, and this sort of had the effect of uh, inevitably separating brothers and sisters uh, from one another, and that's um, something else that uh, many survivors have talked about um, in terms of their experience at residential school, was that even if they went with, um, with siblings uh, or cousins, they would be sort of uh, forced apart um, and wouldn't have the, the comfort of having someone, um, someone close to them nearby. So here you can see the, the boys and girls sides. Um, uh, so back, back to the basement plan, you can see the, the boys and girls sides um, separated by uh, several doorways here and here. Um, and on the other side as well, um, separate washrooms, uh, stairwells, and playrooms on, on either end. Um, and the back wing, which was added after uh, initial construction in 1922, um, had uh, service spaces, including the kitchen and dining room, as well as the boiler room and laundry, um, which uh, survivors have uh, publicly talked about as sites of abuse because they were noisy and thus easy to hide in. So on the ground floor of the building, um, the segregation between boys and girls was, uh, was uh, kind of continued with the boys reading room and the girls reading room on either side, as well as the sewing room, um, which was not only a type of classroom, but also a space of labor as the girls spent many hours mending and sewing uniforms and other clothing. Um, several staff bedrooms and the staff dining room um, were also located on this floor, uh, as well as two symmetrically but sort of diametrically opposed rooms, um, the staff living room and the so-called, and I'm just quoting here, Indian reception room. Um, so going up through uh, the main entrance, there uh, the staff living room was on one side and um, uh, again, uh, survivors often have noted the contrast between the comfortable surroundings um, of the staff living room as compared to the kind of spare character of the reception room for Indigenous visitors. And the latter was often the only space in the building that was accessible to parents. And visits between parents and children um, in this space uh, were very tightly controlled, um, and often staff forbade families from um, speaking Indigenous languages. Um, so the upper floors of the building, um, which you can see in the top plan here, um, uh, these were dedicated to um, the large but often crowded dormitories where children slept at night. So these were also sometimes uh, sites of sickness and when a contagious illness swept through and infected many children. Um, at the Mohawk Institute, the central portion of this floor was dedicated to the principal's living quarters. So you can see that labeled here. 
um, which was not unusual in in many residential schools. The the principals, uh, the principal, and usually his family um, were sort of integrated into the building, um, but uh, but sometimes lived in a in a separate house nearby. And that was what happened in this case. Um, within a few years of this plan from 1950, the um, the principal's quarters were moved um, to the grounds to a detached house. And so incarceration was a feature built into the fabric of many residential schools. Um, I can't show you on plans because that is not something that would likely be kind of included. It would be kind of a, or included, you know, um, in not a not a public way, but in a very explicit way on an architectural plan, but would be kind of would kind of emerge through the 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 use that staff made of the building. Um, so initially uh, at the Mohawk Institute, um, these were uh, located in a separate boys playhouse. Um, and so a visitor uh, from 1907 uh, wrote that other similarities, oh, sorry. Um, I cannot say that I was favorably impressed with the site of two prison cells in the boys playhouse. I was informed, however, that these were for pupils who ran away from the institution confinement being made for a week at a time when pupils returned. And later accounts from survivors also tell of uh, similar spaces of confinement in the main building itself. Um, so the Mohawk Institute is significant for many reasons, but one of those is that uh, at least architecturally it signaled um, the beginnings of what uh, Jeffrey Carr, who I mentioned earlier, calls the second generation of residential schools. So the transition from boarding and industrial schools to a single type that uh, bureaucrats called residential schools came gradually in the decade and a half that followed the construction of the Mohawk Institute. So between about um, 1905 and 1920, when government architects began to take a more active and authoritative role in designing them. So one reason for this shift um, to a kind of more centralized uh, bureaucratic control over residential schools as, where, as well as their architectural uh, form um, was the influence of Dr. Peterson, uh, sorry, Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce's report on the Indian schools of Manitoba and the Northwest Territories um, from 1907. Bryce was a medical doctor with a background in public health who became chief medical officer of the department in 1904. Um, the, the, the department, sorry, the department being the Department of Indian Affairs. And in his report, um, Bryce documented extremely high infection, infection rates uh, and death rates from tuberculosis at 33 uh, schools, uh, residential schools and industrial schools in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So Bryce blamed the TB epidemic on two key causes. Uh, one was the admission of infected children and environmental factors like overcrowding and poor ventilation, which aided in transmission. And uh, two, um, sorry, it, the admission of infected children and two environmental factors like overcrowding and poor ventilation. So um, one was actually taking children who were uh, already slightly sick, but could probably lead a healthy life um, because they were you know, out of doors a lot and, um, not in a very stressful environment, but being kind of brought into a, a residential school as a, as a young child was extremely stressful and exacerbated um, illnesses. Um, and of course, the environmental factors like overcrowding and poor ventilation um, assisted that, that process of uh, TB spread. And so Bryce blamed, uh, blamed all of this in large part on the buildings themselves. Um, and his report led to a contract in 1911 um, between uh, the churches operating the schools and, um, and the government. So although Bryce's epidemiological work focused on the prairie provinces, um, the increasing centralization of control over residential schools meant his results would impact institutions across the country. So even though he just studied um, institutions in those three provinces, um, the, the, the kind of conclusions would, um, would lead to more of a, a centralized control and, um, and, and have an effect on the, the architecture of residential schools across the entire country. <laughs> 
So um, this contract uh, was the first of its kind, which was remarkable because the state, I'm sorry, it keeps switching. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Um, the first of its kind, um, which again was remarkable because the, the state had been involved in residential schools for um, about three decades at this point. Um, so the contracts pegged federal per child funding to certain building standards, including air and floor space minimums, as well as other types of amenities that would have to be included in the physical plant of the institution. And this uh, motivated administrators to improve or rebuild their institutions to obtain higher grants. Um, and it's my contention that the architects of Indian Affairs were increasingly called upon to design and supervise the construction of renovations or new residential schools following these contracts. So Bryce's 1907 report and the 1911 contracts thus served to increase the influence of architects in the residential school system and more broadly in the management of Indigenous peoples by the state. Of course, the professionalization of architecture in Ontario and Canada was ongoing at the time. Um, and the, so the OAA was established in 1889 um, and the RIC uh, was established in 1907. So this also, uh, you know, was, probably influential in, in some sense, but um, the, the report and the contract kind of had a very strong internal effect on, um, on changing the role for, for architects as kind of uh, bureaucrats and, and state actors in the kind of settler state apparatus. So the first third of the 20th century in terms of residential school architecture was defined by two architects, Robert Mitchell Ogilvie and Roland Gurney Orr. With the exception of one or two other architects, Ogilvie and Orr designed 19 and 24 residential schools respectively. So 43 um, new buildings and additions. Um, and Orr, uh, in fact, learned the profession under Ogilvie and spent his entire 30 year career in the Department of Indian Affairs working up from draftsman to chief architect before his death in 1937. And while I don't think it's necessarily important to recover the biographies of these men, although perhaps someone will be interested in taking up that task someday, I think it's important that their work is acknowledged as part of architectural history um, and the history of the profession in Canada. Specifically, I think their work and that of their successors sh shed sort of partial light um, on what it means to be a settler architect, whether that consists of designing buildings to assimilate indigenous children or other kinds of built environments that in Julie Tomiak's words, convert indigenous lands into settler property. And so here I'm talking about this idea of architecture as a kind of uh, marker and, and kind of a way to claim property um, that, um, that, that is an important uh, kind of logic of, of settler colonialism. Um, so this is a, a kind of a little article. It's not an obituary, but I guess it's, it's a similar type of document um, about Roland Gurney Orr. Um, so I'm still researching these architects and especially Orr because he was chief architect of Indian affairs at a time of particularly oppressive state restrictions against indigenous peoples, including compulsory schooling, um, which was often de facto residential schooling, um, not always, but very often, um, restrictions on hiring lawyers and restrictions on cultural practices. Um, and he was clearly very deeply involved in the bureaucracy, um, as you can see by, actually, I think I, sorry, I cut that part off, but um, in the continuation of this article, there's a long list of civil servants who attended his funeral, um, some of them quite well known. Um, but some of the questions I still have center around his design philosophy, the way he saw himself in relation to indigenous peoples, um, whether that even, you know, kind of played a role considering that he, um, he, he did travel uh, to a lot of the places where um, his buildings, residential schools, as well as others were built. Um, but, you know, considering that he had spent his entire career kind of serving um, Indian affairs and, and, the, and the state, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in how, that, uh, how that, I guess, operates as a kind of mode of practice. 
So here are some of um, Roland Gurney Orr's buildings. Um, so the schools became uh, more standardized, not, not completely, um, uh, but they, they were all sort of, uh, again, rigidly symmetrical three-story buildings uh, with a central block and the two wings, um, which was very similar again to the plan of the Mohawk Institute, which is why I consider the Mohawk Institute to be kind of the architectural template for these second generation residential schools. Um, and so the earlier of these, such as the Edmonton Residential School um, or the St. Paul's Residential School in Cardston, um, both in Alberta, um, were styled in this sort of collegiate Gothic um, that was popular for college and high school buildings in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and the, uh, the second uh, kind of style was uh, a sort of a, um, a classical modern with this very, um, uh, this very uh, distinctive um, uh, parapet, sorry, I'm losing my words, um, but you know, flat roofs and so quite, quite different, but with these, um, you know, some of them still had these um, arches that the, the earlier buildings had. Um, these very distinctive stone arches with a with a pointed arch as the as the as the entryway, um, but even you know even though these uh, two styles you could say were you know fairly distinct uh, they were um, the the plans of the buildings were actually quite similar and and didn't change a lot in the entire time that Orr was um, was chief architect. Um, so here's a plan of uh, the Edmonton Residential School, which was built in 1924. Um, and as, as you can see, uh, maybe you remember from, from a little bit earlier, the, you know, it kind of um, very much resembles the, the plan of, um, of the Mohawk Institute, not entirely identical, but I think there's some kind of correlation there. I haven't found any kind of additional evidence. Um, I've been relying just on architectural sources. Um, so it doesn't say anywhere that, you know, this was influenced by the Mohawk Institute, but I think there's, um, there's something there. And so that's why the Mohawk Institute is, um, I mean, one of the many numerous reasons it's significant is because I think it served as this sort of architectural model. Um, so again, you have the, the boys and girls on, on opposite sides of the building. Um, you know, boys study, the sewing room, which was the girls space, um, kind of assembly hall at back um, and the boys and girls dormitories. So um, again, super segregated um, by, uh, by gender and, and often by, by age as well. Um, so this is another example uh, of, of Orr's uh, residential schools, the, the Kokolitsa Institute. And um, so this was, it has a similar story as uh, some of the other residential schools I've discussed um, in that it started as a missionary institution and then eventually was rebuilt by the government um, in the late 19th century and yet again in, um, in the 1920s. Um, and so this, this is a little bit more distinctive than um, from, from some of the other, uh, the kind of two main quote unquote styles I've, I've described um, because it had this kind of half timbering. And um, I think that was an attempt to kind of uh, fit it into the, uh, the uh, British Columbian environment. There were other uh, significant buildings um, at the time that uh, Orr might've seen on his visit to the province um, that he kind of used as uh, uh, as a way to kind of regionalize the, the, the building. And um, this, uh, this residential school, Kokolitsa, um, also differed in, in its plan. So even though most of the plan and the massing was very similar, um, uh, the principal, George Rayleigh, was actually quite involved in, in the design process. And um, historian Paige Raybon outlines this in a, in a paper on Rayleigh and the and the and his principalship of Kokolitsa, um, but uh, but so here you see a uh, a senior boy's bedroom with two 
two beds, so two two roommates would um, would share share a room, and this was highly unusual. This was very different from um, the usual large, very large dormitories um, that were built in in residential schools. So they had uh, so this school had um, smaller bedrooms for um, for the older students and um, uh, and 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 so sort of smaller dormitories for the for the younger students. So there were, you know, more than two of the younger students per room, but it was still quite a lot smaller than the than the kind of um, very open and overcrowded dormitories in most other residential schools. So that kind of shows. Um, you know, how there were these other actors. And I'm interested in that as well. You know, uh, I don't want to attribute everything to um, to this one architect. Uh, I'm interested in how other actors kind of external to, um, to Indian Affairs architectural bureaucracy had an influence on, um, on how, these, how these buildings were built. Um, so this is uh, a, um, a, an aerial of, uh, of Kokolitsa around 1946. And um, right around the beginning of World War II, Kokolitsa was um, actually converted into a hospital. And, um, and it became part of um, a network of so-called Indian hospitals, which were segregated institutions um, at first also run by the Department of Indian Affairs, but then eventually run by a sort of separate entity within um, uh, within the Department of Health, uh, the National Department of Health. So um, I'm bringing this up, I don't wanna dwell on it for too long, but, um, but I'm bringing it up because there's this connection between residential schools and the segregated hospitals that is, uh, you know, has been noted by, um, by survivors who have been at both types of institutions, as well as by historians. There's a, a couple of, uh, of books now about the Indian hospitals. Um, and I'm interested in recovering the kind of architectural relationship between these institutions. So um, one type of relationship, of course, is this temporal relationship where the Kokolitsa residential school was simply converted into a hospital. And you know, even though there were renovations made, um, uh, there, there was this kind of facility, you know, and so that kind of makes a relationship between these two different types of institutions. Um, uh, another way that they were related was, of course, that people were simply kind of uh, made to travel between them. So often, um, you know, children who got sick at a residential school were sent to a hospital. Um, once they had recovered, they might be sent back to the residential school, sometimes without uh, any knowledge by their by their families of of where they had been sent. Um, also, uh, you know, the bureaucracy kind of spent a lot of effort recruiting indigenous workers to work in the hospital. So sometimes, um, people who graduated from residential schools uh, simply went to work uh, in a hospital, or if they were a patient, they uh, they recovered and um, and stayed to work at the hospital. So there are these kind of uh, various architectural and sort of more generally spatial relationships that I'm that I'm quite interested in. And this is just to show how so although the interior renovations were a bit more extensive, um, these are the only exterior renovations um, to convert the Kokolitsa Institute to the Kokolitsa Hospital. So the addition of a couple of dormers and this elevator shaft um, so, uh, you know, it pretty much kind of retained uh, the, the same appearance as it had throughout its, uh, its time as a residential school once it became a hospital. Um, and the other thing was that um, a lot of uh, residential school students uh, came to occupy Kokolitsa as a hospital following um, its conversion. So uh, children from other residential schools were sent there as patients and a large proportion of the patients remained um, uh, residential school students. So there was this kind of, again, overlap between these two systems. Um, so here's uh, two designs. I just wanted to show this because um, these are kind of drawings that represent the two types of uh, buildings that are designed for, for residential schools. And these are actually for the same, um, for the same location for the Shingwok 
a residential school in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, um, which has a, a long history with the Garden River First Nation. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I just wanted to show these a little bit more up close, these drawings. And um, so the, ultimately the, the design that was built is the one on the right. Um, you can visit the building today. It's a little bit far if you're in Toronto, um, but they do offer virtual tours. So I highly recommend those um, if you would like to visit virtually. Um, so after World War II, um, residential schools were still being built. And um, sorry, um, this was a, a, a piece I, I wrote last month for Canadian Architect um, that looks at this more recent history um, of, of new residential schools. Um, and I think quite an invisible history, because as I mentioned in this article, there's, um, you know, a lot of the media depictions of, of residential schools use uh, really old black and white photos from the 19th century, the early 20th century. And there was this entire um, sort of realm of, of post-war residential schools that were being newly built or added to. Um, and this is not, so the, the image here is not a residential school, it's a, it's a day school, but um, I, I wanted to show this, this image because um, this was part of a film strip that was used to teach English to Indigenous adults in Northern Ontario um, called We Learn English. And um, so that there were a variety of different images of, uh, of buildings in the community. And um, so Indian Affairs specifically requested that the school be rendered as a kind of new modern school and not kind of have a, a, traditional, um, a traditional appearance. So the, there was this link being made between um, modernism, architectural modernism and the sort of uh, more, I guess, progressive relationship that the that the government or at least the appearance of, of progress that the government wanted to um, to portray with regards to its um, relationship with indigenous peoples in the in the post-war era so this was from the the 1950s um, Sorry, I just lost what I, what I was looking for. Um, okay, yes. So, um, so I, I, this is also from the, the Canadian Architect article that I, um, oh, and I have the wrong caption here, I'm sorry. I must have saved in a slightly older version. Um, but this is a, um, I, I, I use this image to kind of talk about the fact that, um, you know, even though residential schools seem like marginal architectures, uh, you know, and it was kind of these children who were kept there and um, this sort of anonymous bureaucracy, uh, you know, there were parts of it that were very much part of mainstream architectural culture. And so um, I recently uh, actually looked at the archives of this firm, uh, which was Gardner Thor Thornton Gathay. Um, and associates of Vancouver-based firm. Um, and their archives are held at the Canadian Centre for Architecture. Um, uh, they received a, um, a federal design award for, for this project, which is the uh, St. Mary's Residential School. Um, and that's in uh, Stolo and Coast Salish territories um, or Mission Bridge, Columbia. Um, so, Basically, I, I'm just trying to point out that, uh, and, and there are a couple of other examples of this, you know, where um, residential schools have this really modern image and were meant to convey this kind of progressive view, although, you know, in, in essence, they operated uh, in a very similar fashion as they had since the time of the missionary and industrial schools um, of the 19th century, separating Indigenous children, um, the, the half-day system of work, which um, which was how a lot of institutions essentially made money to operate, um, which was to force children to work for half the day and 
um, sit in the classroom for the rest of the day. Um, stopped in, you know, sort of throughout the, the 1950s and I think into the, into the 60s. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that was kind of maybe a little bit different in terms of the experience children had in these institutions. But on the other hand, um, you know, I've read uh, survivors talking about this particular institution and how the, the conditions of abuse actually got worse in that, in that time period. So there's always these kind of multiple layers of, you know, image and reality um, in, in, with regards to this history. And then I wanted to uh, talk sort of a little bit uh, briefly. I know, I know I'm running out of time. So, but I just wanted to, um, to finish my discussion of architects specifically with, um, with another, with, with an example of another architect uh, also working in Indian affairs, but working more in this time period of the of the 60s and 70s. Um, so this was, you know, uh, this was a, a hostel to actually replace the Christie Residential School, um, which I believe had been designed by by Orr. Um, and so it it has, a, you know, and the the words you used to describe this project are again very kind of progressive, very, you know, they talk about the indigenous art that has been included in in the project, um, and it's it's a hostel, not a residential school. So that means that children live there but go to school at the public school um, in town, and so that had its own kind of um, issues with regards to culturally appropriate education. Um, and, you know, the system continued to sort of separate children um, from their families for long, for long stretches of time, even into this, uh, even into this time period. And of course, they're, you know, open to the, the usual sorts of abuses. Um, this was another project by that same architect, J.W. Francis, um, for a model house in a community called Pegwis First Nation in Manitoba. And the idea was to have um, day school students build this build this house as a kind of demonstration, and um, you know have community members kind of look at it and and kind of aspire to build a similar house um, for themselves. Um, and finally, again, J. W. Francis, so very like prolific, very working in across typologies, um, was the Indians of Canada Pavilion for Expo sixty seven. So there's a kind of very um, complex history of, you know, how the, the design was essentially kind of a fait accompli before um, an Indigenous um, committee was able to kind of at least take control of the exhibits that were inside the building. Um, so it, it's, an, it's a kind of, um, you know, complex site of interaction and negotiation and uh, coercion, you know, and essentially um, uh, it, it talks about uh, representation and um, sovereignty in terms of visual and architectural uh, representation. So I wanted to um, finish by just noting that uh, this is this is a work in progress, and I've tried to kind of hopefully um, you know share something that is uh, makes sense to you and and is meaningful and interesting, and hopefully inspired you to go read more more. Um, historical work or, you know, uh, memoirs by survivors, uh, which are, you know, very instructive um, and to engage also with, um, with Indigenous scholars who, who write about residential schools. Um, so I'm very narrowly focused on, um, on architecture. Um, I'm not just looking at residential schools, I'm looking at all of these different building types that, um, that the, the bureaucracy produced. And I'm focusing on the 20th century um, so there's a lot, you know, there's a lot more work to do on this topic, and I don't claim to be an expert in any way, shape, or form, um, but I am trying to kind of look, you know, and primarily engage architectural evidence to kind of tell this uh, sort of different story about Canadian architectural history, and again, the role that architecture plays in um, in the history of residential schools, but more broadly, settler-Indigenous relations and what it means to um, to uh, to work as an architect in a in a in a settler colonial nation. Um, okay, I know I've said I'll, I'll finish up uh, a few times already, but um, this uh, I just wanted to bring up the TRC report because 
Um, there's a lot of interesting work happening in terms of preservation of, uh, of residential school sites, most of which is work that is led by um, the communities that were themselves affected. So I just wanted to draw attention to um, call to action number 79. Um, which talks about uh, developing um, heritage and commemoration. So when we think back to the kind of uh, quote unquote architects of the residential schools that, um, that we looked at at the very beginning, um, what is the kind of counterpoint to that? You know, what do we, uh, we, or, you know, I, I shouldn't use that term, we, you know, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> um, what, what, I mean, we can say we if we include everybody, right? Um, but we meaning people who are interested, people who are interested in architecture, people who are interested in heritage, people who are interested in, um, in uh, you know, developing as settlers better relationships with Indigenous peoples, um, Indigenous peoples who are looking for um, more uh, kind of sovereignty over the representations of heritage that um, that appear in in public space, which is uh, you know, in it, it's all indigenous territory, right? Um, whether it's unceded territory or there's treaties or um, there are different types of uh, land claim agreements, um, it is all indigenous territory. And so, you know, kind of thinking through that as um, as non-Indigenous or settler uh, placemakers and, um, and whether that's through looking, you know, studying uh, kind of understudied subjects or um, as practitioners uh, getting involved in, um, in, in different initiatives. Um, for example, this is just one, um, one example that, that, is, uh, that is relevant to the, the discussion of preservation and commemoration and the kinds of stories that get told in in public space. So uh, number three, developing and implementing a national heritage plan and strategy for commemorating residential school sites. So um, there's a lot of good work happening uh, on that already. The Six Nations with the Mohawk Institute, um, the Shingwak Residential School Center, which works with survivors, um, Portage La Prairie, which is in Manitoba, which is developing a museum, um, and several residential school sites that have already been named uh, national historic sites. So I think you know there is um, there's a lot to kind of follow along with. People are already doing this work, um, and so I think you know the the idea of uh, of erasing history, as I mentioned, is you know it's it's not about erasing history. It's about what um, what are the kind of public stories we we want to tell? So I'll end there. Um, I apologize for going a little bit over time, but I welcome any comments, questions, um, critiques. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Magda. Um, Julia is actually going to lead the Q and A. Uh, I would invite everybody to to um, please put your uh, questions into the Q and A. Uh, don't be bashful or hesitant. So we don't have any questions yet, but I guess we'll just wait for them to roll in. Um, in the meantime. I think you're muted, Julia. Students and practicing architects, how important it is to recognize our past. Was it just me? I, I missed the first part of that. Could you yeah. repeat that? Yeah, sure. can you please repeat? Yeah, yeah, sorry. My, I just got a, a message saying my internet connection's cutting out a bit. So um, you made an interesting comment about how architecture can exist in, how about how architect, architecture can exist in Canada, given our past. So could you just expand a bit more on that to remind architecture students and practicing architects how important it is to recognize our past? Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm still like, I think about this a lot and I, I mean, I don't have like a singular answer but I can share some of my thoughts. Like here in the, in the Haldeman tract where I um, live and work, there was uh, a, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council issued a development moratorium. And 
that was tied to this um, uh, history of um, blocking these subdivisions, these developments from happening in a couple of uh, locations near there. Um, well, within the, the, the larger Haldeman territory, but kind of closer to their community of Six Nations. Um, and so that, you know, when I read about that, that really struck me because that's, you know, it, it and I, I, uh, I don't remember who, who said this, but they were quoted in, um, in an article about this issue. Um, and the, the idea was that essentially once, once a piece of land is is built it's like it's gone you know if you have houses and and people living in them um you know on this on this piece of land it's like they you know the 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 six nations um lands and resources uh essentially see that as kind of lost land you know because i don't think that they would evict people from their homes but those homes are you know potentially built on um you know illegally acquired land and so it's it's just you know there's this in, in this particular area where I live there's this long history of like sales and um, illegal occupations and squatters and this this land got sort of uh, eroded away over over hundreds of years um, but we sort of think of that as like okay that's done that's in the past but it's like how is that happening today you know with um, development projects, pipeline projects. And I know that architects don't always see themselves as kind of directly involved because, um, you know, uh, I mean, we don't really design pipelines. <laughs> um, but there's, you know, there's always a lot of, uh, I mean, I'll give another example. So there was um, in, uh, in the Mackenzie Valley in the Northwest Territories in the 70s, there, were, there was a proposal for a pipeline. Um, and it never, it never actually ended up happening. Um, there was some good that came out of it because there were uh, uh, some um, uh, land claims agreements that, that happened because, of, because that pipeline was proposed. And so the government was kind of forced to deal with the issue of, of indigenous land. But um, another thing I, I recently looked at at the, at the CCA was uh, Van Ginkle Associates, which was a Canadian architecture and planning firm and their involvement in that in that pipeline project so they were essentially working for the um for the um the consortium of uh of uh of petrochemical producers um and they you know they had a role as architects and planners to kind of envision how uh these communities would develop um uh you know if the pipeline was built you know then you have to build uh, towns and amenities and and so forth. So there's, um, so and it's yeah, it's a it's a tricky issue because I don't. I mean, I'm no longer. I, I don't practice, and I, I was never actually an architect. I was an intern architect, but um, so I don't want to like dump on architects and say you know all bad. I just mean like, uh, you know, even just as everyday people, you know, not not architects, but just people, you know, living um, in these. In these territories, how what does that mean? And and this, I don't know. Just thinking about this long history of like how, um, you know, what what does it mean, and how how can it uh, how can, for example, non-indigenous folks support indigenous communities? Um, how can you know what what can we do? You know, it's it seems like such an insurmountable issue, but. Um, it's it's about finding those those little kind of ways out, I guess. That uh, yeah, and 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 just thinking critically, I guess, about um, about what what we do. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Um, the topology of schools you have presented does not appear to be very different from the school architecture of the period, and in particular from the British industrial schools. What differentiates the schools produced by the architects of the Department of Indian Affairs? And are there, are there other elements than the transposition of a foreign architectural model and its use to co colonize the indigenous populations that would allow us to speak of colonial architecture? So I, yeah, that's not, that's not work that 
I have done. I mean, I've I've definitely noted uh, similarities, but um, I haven't done a detailed analysis just because, um, you know, I'm I'm focusing on the the twenties to the seventies roughly, and it you know it's it's like this uh, it's it's kind of like you know the the genesis that I was talking about with regards to the so-called architects of residential schools where you, you kind of keep going back to find the ultimate source and it's like well yeah, I mean you just keep going back forever so it's it's not that that's not a legitimate question I just haven't looked at it um, very closely I mean I think the issue of uh, of the transposition of um, you know an essentially European model and its use in this program is kind of significant in itself um, as you say and there's a very good paper by uh, Rina Swensel, um, who writes about uh, Pueblos and um, contrasting the Pueblo with a, uh, a Bureau of Indian Affairs day school. So that's in the in the state. So there's there's a different um, type of bureaucracy there, but in many ways similar to, to Canada. Um, and that's in, in uh, Places Journal, I believe. Um, so yeah, sorry, I don't have a better answer. I, it, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's a worthy uh, question to ask, but um, it's not something I've looked at very closely. Okay, another question, uh, a comment actually saying thank you for such a great presentation, and another question saying, um, asking if you're intending to pursue your research beyond the residential schools, uh, because they'd like to know. They'd like to see how you can contrast the work of contemporary architects who have attempted to, to design new schools in collaboration with the communities to those of the past. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm getting to that point in my dissertation where I'm very <laughs> overwhelmed. And, um, and so that's also a very, very good question, but I'm not looking at contemporary issues very deeply. Um, there was a series of uh, of school designs. Um, I think most people know them, but the names of the architects are escaping me right now. I apologize. Um, but like in the late 80s, early 90s in, in British Columbia, I think in particular, I think Pat Cow was one of the firms. And there was um, a, a bunch of collaborations between, um, uh, between various First Nations and, um, and different architectural firms. And I think those have been kind of universally uh, seen as like positive examples and the um i actually talked to the um the the um sorry the 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 architect who was uh working with the government um on on those projects so she was kind of a a liaison and um so no that's a that's a very good question i think you know the the continuation of like past the you know more into the era of like when communities were beginning to hire their own consultants when um you know it became more of a collaborative process uh there's um there's a good uh, uh an article of of that time era that talks about um the the kind of transfer of control over architectural design um but i i can't uh if anyone is interested please email me um and i can i can find that for you if, if you're interested in that topic um the kind of just discussing the kind of transfer of you know from the government kind of imposing um architecture on communities to uh to communities taking more control over that um so again, a good uh, a good topic for further study, but not something I've looked at personally. Okay, and another question. These projects seem to fit squarely into the understanding of architecture as a disciplinary apparatus, as described by Foucault in Discipline and Punish, especially in the example of, of Kokolitsa, where the architectural topology translates seamlessly from school to hospital from one disciplinary institution to another. Do you have any thoughts about this, about how the architecture is first and foremost an apparatus of discipline and control? 
That's a that's also a good question. Um, I was actually looking through some of my old material today, and I had quoted Foucault. I haven't engaged with him very much since then, but um, I looked up his definition of an apparatus, and it was uh, essentially all these things like uh, you know like rules and buildings and all these different elements. And then the apparatus is like the network among these elements. I think that's, I think that's what he meant. So it's this whole array, right? So like architecture could conceivably be part of an apparatus. And that's how I, I still think of the, you know, the way that architecture fits into um, uh, that whole bureaucracy that was attempting to control indigenous peoples on behalf of the settler state as an apparatus and as archi an architecture as an element in that apparatus. So I don't have any more uh, uh, phenomenal insights than that. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's something that, you know, I think architecture operates together with other means of, um, of discipline or control. Um, I, I think, you know, architecture, <laughs> I, I don't want to sound too, like, um, too, uh, hmm, too sort of trite about it, but my, some of my friends and I were joking that architecture is actually very boring. Um, it just architecture, right? Like, if, if there's a building and there's nobody in it, nothing is happening around it, it's, like, it's just a bunch of bricks or a bunch of wood, right? It's like architecture becomes interesting when you think about, um, you know, various things, the, the, it's, you know, it's relationship with um, the ecological system. It's, you know, the way it's materials have been, um, have been, you know, maybe engineered to operate in a certain way, the way that people use a building, you know, that's when it becomes interesting. So in the same vein, I guess, um, you know, architecture, uh, has to, in, in, in a lot of cases, you know, especially when you're dealing with kind of difficult histories and histories of oppression, have, it has to be read in conjunction with other, um, other parts of the apparatus, if you will. So that's, yeah, that's how I, that's how I try to think of it. Um, but it is hard because as, you know, as architects and as architectural historians often were, you know, it's a very interdisciplinary field, but then we're expected to kind of know, um, a lot about everything, right? And sometimes it feels like, well, we can't know everything about everything. So, yeah. Also, do you think the bureaucracy became self-serving in any way, which led to some of the question questionable decisions, or do you think it was a top-down political decision? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, maybe if, do you wanna add a clarifying remark? Cause the way I'm reading it, it means, um, so let's say these architects working within this one government department where they were, you know, had an immense amount of control over indigenous communities. Um, were they just kind of carrying out decisions made at a higher level? or were they kind of operating for themselves? Yeah, that's a very, if, if I'm reading it correctly, it's a very um, complex question. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. That's again, like uh, I would love to be able to know that more deeply. I feel like, um, you know, sometimes you have to be like a, if you're studying architectural history, you also have to be like a medical historian and a political historian and all these other things. And so um, mm, it's a good question and I'll keep it in mind. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. I think that's all we have for the questions, unless we have anyone else who wants to ask another question. May, may I ask a question? Uh, I, I don't know if, well, I, I'm kind of guessing that, that the answer is uh, going to be obvious, but I, I wonder, was there ever a point when the architecture community began to censure uh, 
or, or otherwise, you know, call for architects to not take part in these kinds of buildings. You know, the way we have like with prisons today, you know, where, where there's there's this really big movement to stop something that's seen as socially unacceptable. Did, did that ever happen, or did this just sort of peter out and there was enough buildings so it didn't matter anymore? Or how how um, how did the architecture community actually react to this, other than giving awards? Um, that I'm aware of, not at all. Um, <laughs> it seems to be so so marginal to the to the profession. Like I'm, mm. in a way, I guess I'm maybe I'm forcing it a little, but I'm trying to kind of reintegrate this into you know our ideas about the profession. That this is also kind of part of the the history of the profession. Um, but I haven't really found anything. I mean, there were. Um, you know, there were some architects who, uh, I mean, like J.W. Francis, the one I talked about briefly at the very end, who, you know, he worked for the government, like he was a government architect, but uh, the government would also hire uh, uh, private architecture firms to, to do some of this work. So they were involved, but I think, you know, like the rest of the, uh, like the rest of society at the time, um, it seemed like most people thought it was just normal. Um, and that, uh, and that maybe there was, you know, you know, like with um, Principal Rayleigh and his work on Kokolitsa, trying to make the conditions better, but not ultimately kind of questioning the whole thing. Um, maybe trying to make nice buildings for for these, uh, but but you know, not getting, not really making a huge difference because they were kind of operating within this system that that existed that was quite quite a bit larger than than just the architecture so yeah so i that would be that would be really really interesting to know if there was um uh i mean there might have been it's it's you know it's it's also hard to to track to track these things sometimes um you know as uh, i mean historians i i think it's you know it's more of a um more of a thing these days to look at uh archives in places where you might not um, you know, things that you might not have traditionally looked at to, to study architecture. Um, but I am also like, I will admit, I am very focused on kind of government archives because, because that work hasn't been done. Right. So I would prefer to be looking at, um, you know, maybe like letters and in, in somebody's attic or something, but, um, uh, or, you know, um, archives in, in specific communities, but I'm, I am, looking a lot at this kind of large archive because um, because it just hasn't been looked at. And so that seems like the kind of uh, maybe maybe a little bit too easy, but but a place to to start and to begin the conversation. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a good question and I would love to find some some evidence of of that as well. Thanks. There, there's a few more questions. I don't know if you wanted to to read them for us, Julia. Oh, sure. Um, do you think architects working for Indian Affairs at that time were carrying out their work to the best of their abilities without awareness of the impact the institutions they designed had on the Indigenous community? And what do you think we as architects are doing now that will not be considered positively in the future? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's, it's important to have those conversations because that's that's definitely I mean like those that that kind of argument you know some people have that argument about um, various politicians and so forth about well they were just kind of doing what um, they were a product of their time and they were operating in that cultural milieu and and so on and that's important to consider of course um, yeah I mean I think you know with with residential schools there was this after so the last residential school technically closed in I think 1996 but most of them had been phased out in the 60s and 70s um, so there were still a few operating as late as the the 90s um, but I think oh and and for this I I can share I think I can share in the chat maybe um Oh no, that's just for host and panelists. So I'll try to remember it. Um, Diane Millian, 
felt theory and it's a paper and she writes about um how the sort of uh the narrative of um she draws a parallel between um the the occurrence of abuse at residential schools with um uh with domestic with domestic abuse and the and how the the kind of um you know how maybe it was known by some but it was kind of considered a private issue a domestic issue and then how gradually it turned into a public issue you know with survivors um beginning to disclose more publicly that this is actually what happened in residential schools um and i think phil fontaine was like one of the um one of the not necessarily the first by any means but one of the first and one of the most prominent um survivors to do that um so what oh yes yeah, so why am i why am i talking about that impact indigenous community um so i think yeah i mean it it is like i think in general, society's understanding of residential schools has obviously changed since the 90s, since survivors started coming out with their stories, right? Um, so it's, you know, um, I mean, as a as a historian, you're always kind of uh, re revising your interpretation of things uh, based on um, the evidence available, and I think. You know, I don't have an answer to the question of whether architects in Indian affairs knew about all of the bad things that were happening in residential schools. There was a lot that was, you know, publicly known and like it was just accepted as part of residential schools, such as the fact that children, sometimes very young children, were separated from their families. And that was, you know, that was not something that was hidden or unknown. Um, so, the, you know, there was, uh, and there was often still a kind of cultural superiority, you know, um, white supremacy, white supremacy kind of attitude. Um, so I don't, I don't have an answer to that question with regards to the architect specifically. Um, I'm trying to get at that, and that's um, that's hopefully something I'll, uh, yeah, I'll be able to to get at um, as I finish up my dissertation. And do you know when the last new residential school was built? Um, it might have been the one I showed by by Francis, the hostel. So potentially not technically a residential school since it was only a, a residence. Um, but that was, if not the last one, among the last ones. So I think because that whole system was sort of being phased out in the late 60s and early 70s not much new construction happened um, after then but that's also a good a good question um, sometimes uh, yeah sometimes you you uh, you find a first and last and then you know a little bit later it turns out oh there's actually an earlier thing or a later thing so um, that that's the that's the last one I know of um, another one, are there any keywords or terms that show up in the archive that would um, would allow us in, would would help us in deepening our research? Hmm. Can you maybe clarify what archive you mean? Or just the archive, like the the whole repository of available material? I think they're just um, asking what they can what keywords they can search like in rula for example which is the ryerson library where we can search um any keywords that would help us deepen our research about this topic um i'm not thinking of anything beyond the obvious i mean there's a lot of material on residential schools like the historians in kind of general history have been writing about this um and of course uh people in indigenous studies um i would also maybe look at 
specific uh, journals if you're interested in specific perspectives. Um, but I guess that that would that would all kind of show up. I mean, I I would maybe I would start with um, you know looking at specific communities and specific institutions. Um, I find that you know the 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 reason I became so uh, concerned with this topic is because this residential school existed not very far from where I studied architecture, um, and I had no idea for the longest time. And so that that made a kind of impact on me, and um, and also because I was able to visit it and actually see the building and um, and hear survivor perspectives on it. Um, so yeah, so uh, I mean, there's uh, the website of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation um, has a really good archive. It's uh, a lot of the material that was collected by the commission. Um, and you can look up specific um, institutions there. Um, other keywords, I nothing is coming to mind. Um, I would uh, maybe try to find, um, I mean, I would also recommend reading um, uh, survivor memoirs and and biographies um, to get uh, uh, a, you know a, a, a kind of first person perspective I think that's that's also important and considering residential schools reconciliation do you think hiring indigenous architects planners or designers for projects um, do you think that would advance reconciliation That's a very complex question that I'm not prepared to answer, but I would say, you know, um, looking at the work that Indigenous architects do, um, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, everyone likes to get hired, right? So uh, supporting Indigenous architecture by hiring Indigenous architects, if, if they're available, if they're not already massively overworked. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you're probably aware, but looking at like the REIC's um, Indigenous Task Force and their work, um, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, I mean, the whole idea of reconciliation is, is very complex and, um, and it's it's a, I mean, some people really hate that word now and don't like to use it. And so there's like, it's I guess it's just about like, um, you know, engaging in 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 positive ways, um, and 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 also listening to, um, uh, you know, reading about the work of indigenous uh, architects, reading indigenous scholars, reading indigenous writers. Um, I think that's, you know, that's something that non-Indigenous people can do for sure to, you know, and, and those of us in, in architecture, um, just familiarize yourself with the, with the, the profession from the perspective of uh, Indigenous architects. There's not that many in, in Canada. Um, there's more and more, um, but uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, they, um, they, their, their work deserves attention and, I think it's a good way, um, you know, if you're interested in architecture, to uh, to 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 further your your knowledge um, of in, of indigenous communities and indigenous worldviews. There's a there's a great book called Our Voices. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. Um, that uh, that is an all indigenous anthology um, of writing about architecture. I think there's a, a couple of um, sequels now. Um, so yeah, just just reading and, and familiarizing yourself with the with the issues. Great. Uh, th thank you, Magda. Um, maybe that's a, a good um, note to, to finish on. I'd like to ask uh, Marwa to actually um, give her a thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, so from all of us in the Department of Architectural Science, we would like to thank you, Magda Nella, uh, for sharing your work with us. Your, word your words this evening have left us with a stronger understanding of how complicit design is in uh, creating oppressive spaces, perhaps, 
uh, and the complexity of the history that it, that um, Churchill Island and uh, is uh, has it gone through. Um, so it's really crucial to have these conversations around the role that architecture has in the genocidal history between the settler state and indigenous people in order to bring light to what the past was once and learn from our present uh, so that it can guide us into a better understanding of how we as designers can build a more inclusive future. And as many of you may already know, in August of this year, uh, the university announced that it would begin a renaming process to reconcile the legacy of Egerton Morrison with a more inclusive future and fulfill all the 22 recommendations provided by the Standing Strong uh, Task Force. And this lecture uh, that we just heard hopefully gives us all a framework to consider this matter and start learning about how our obligations as settler, guest, or designer in this territory. Um, and uh, we encourage you to further discuss uh, these hard questions regarding what needs to be done uh, once we're aware of indigenous presence. So that um, so that and that requires us to remain uncomfortable, and it means making more concrete, disruptive change. And it all starts here. Uh, so if you're interested in the university's journey uh, and process onwards, you can find more information at X University's Next Chapter page. Um, it's our responsibility to continue learning and unlearning, so we welcome you to look through some of the resources that we will provide soon in the lecture's description on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Marwa. Um, so I, I would like to, uh, I guess, bring this to, to a formal close. Uh, uh, so thank you once again, uh, my Magdalena, for joining us again. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I can speak personally. I, I grew up in Brandon, Manitoba. I had no idea. Uh, I saw the name of the town I grew up in. I had one of these schools. So just like you, I, I, uh, it, it's it's not shocking. It's just um, disappointing to be learning uh, so late in life. So so thank you so much for that. Um, so uh, I guess to formally close it on, on behalf of the Department of Architecture Science, uh, thanks everybody who, who's joined us and, and who has stayed uh, here and given um, uh, and sort of added their, their, their questions and comments uh, so that we could uh, learn uh, from the presence of, of Magdalena. Uh, so thanks also, I should say, especially to the Department of Architectural Science staff, including Alexandra Versano uh, and our two technicians, uh, Michael and Leo, uh, and of course, also the student members of our community, uh, two of which are, are here today, uh, for your enthusiasm in planning today's lecture. Uh, we, we had lots of talks uh, before you came, and, and so uh, it's very nice to, to see it come to fruition. Uh, and I would like to also, before we leave, remind you all that um, uh, on Thursday, November 4th, uh, the, uh, we will have uh, Randy De Silva, who will be speaking on the role uh, that architectural publication uh, can play in building a freer and more inclusive landscape within the profession. So I, I hope to see you all there. Uh, and uh, yeah, great. Let, let's uh, finish there. And, and thank you very much uh, for a successful meeting. Thanks very much. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.